Okay, welcome to another AQA tutorial. This time are five questions on moments, and they all are multiple choice questions uh, because these multiple choice questions do require quite a bit of thought sometimes and certainly test your understanding very well. So question number one is going to be about um, just, again, moments, but it involves some understanding of couples. So if you've understood uh, what couples are, um, if we just read the actual uh, definition here, it says a couple is a pair of equal and opposite forces acting on a body but not along the same line. So here we have a force and another force. They are equal in magnitude, opposite in directions. And um, if we think of just the forces in the X and the Y, well in the Y in particular now, the forces in the Y cancel each other out. So what this means is it will not accelerate up or down because of these forces. The forces cancel each other out in that sense. But they do produce rotation. They'll produce accelerating rotation, in fact. Um, so they just pure, produce a pure torque. All right, so if you have the time, you can read this uh, definition and see that um, uh, a neat little trick is is that you don't have to, for instance, if you're taking the pivot point as being here, right, um, you could calculate the total torque, which would be F times X and F times uh, this distance minus X, right? Um, and when you crunch all the numbers out, it just turns out that you can just simply calculate F times D. So take one of the forces and multiply it by the distance between them, perpendicular distance between them, and you can um, calculate the total torque. So it's a neat, uh, quick way of doing this. Right, so let's move on to that question number one, which tests your understanding of this. So here we have, pause the, question, uh, pause the video, read the question, and have a try of it, if you haven't already. Okay, so now let's have a think about what's going on in this question. If I was to get a little person and hang them from here, like my kids might want to do, right? So their legs either side of the door, but if they're hanging on here, smiling their heads off, you can imagine that it is likely that this hinge is going to get yanked off or broken here by pulling, and this hinge is going to get pushed into the wood. In fact, you can think that this hinge is pulling and this hinge is pushing, right? Um, it says that the moment of the couple that the hinges exert on the door is question mark. Whoops. Well, the weight of the door acting directly down here is turning this whole thing this way, which is clockwise. And then you've got, you must have, if this thing is in equilibrium, an anti-clockwise moment to balance it. And that moment is being provided by the hinges. So the pure torque being provided by the hinges must be the same as whatever the torque being provided by the weight of the door acting from its center of mass is. So the center of mass of the door is here, which is directly above this. This is 1.5 meters, so it's half of that. So the moment should be equal to just force times distance. And since this moment of the weight is going to be the same as the um, couple provided by the hinges, then I can just calculate the moment of the weight to find the magnitude of the couple provided by the hinges. So that's 200 times 0 0.75, which comes out as 150 newton meters, which is A. Okay, next question. Pause the video and read the question if you haven't already. Okay, so the question says that a car wheel nut can be loosened by applying a force of 200 newtons on the end of a bar of length 0.8, right? As in x, x. A car, mechanical is, a car mechanic is capable of applying forces of 500 newtons simultaneously in opposite directions on both ends of a wheel, as in y. So this is what they're capable of doing. What is the minimum length l, l, which would be needed for him to loosen the nut. Right, so what we're being told is this will loosen the nut. It's just enough to do it. So the torque is going to be force times distance. So just for this one, the torque being provided here or the moment being provided here is just F times D, which is 0. Uh, sorry, 200 times 0. 0.8, which comes out as a 160 
160 newton meters. So basically, we need to equal 160 newton meters with the torque produced by this. Well, if we remember from our handy definition of a couple, you don't need to do 500 times half of L plus 500 times half of L. You can just do 500 times L needs to produce 160 newton meters of torque. And from here, it's just a simple rearrangement. 160 divided by 500 gives me 0.32, I think, yeah, 0.32 meters. So that is the minimum length required to open this nut. Next question. Looks similar to one we've already seen. Pause the video, read the question. Okay. This time we're being told that the uniform square block is sliding with uniform speed. If the speed is uniform, well, certainly if the velocity is uniform, we know that the forces must be balanced. Okay, so I'm going to assume that the forces are balanced. A, a rough surface is providing some friction, so that rough surface is providing fr friction in the opposite direction to the direction of movement, right? Because that's the way friction works. The force used to move the block is 200 newtons. The moment of the frictional force acting on the block about the center of gravity, so we're talking about taking moments about here, is. Right, let's have a think about this. So, we've got a force of 200 newtons acting from the floor in this direction. Okay, take, something's pushing it this way, maybe it's being pushed here, we don't really know, it doesn't really matter, it just says the moment of the frictional force acting on the block about the center of gravity, so it's like we're taking moments from here. So, moments is force times perpendicular distance, well, the distance from there to there, and this is perpendicular at a right angle, is half of 0.5, so it's going to be, um, sorry, moment equals force times distance, the force is 200 times 0.75, because it's half of that, whoops, half of that, gives us 150 newton meters, but in what um, direction, clockwise or anti-clockwise? Well, if you took this force and just consider it on its own, it would be making the block turn around this way. So that is clockwise. So we're going to go for A. Okay, next chunk. This is a definition that you really need to remember, right? There's a couple of definitions in physics you need to remember. You need to know the conditions of equilibrium, okay? The conditions of equilibrium are basically the principle of moments, really. Firstly, which is that um, sorry. Secondly, in this in in this um, example, uh, in this book, so the principle of moments basically is that moments the sum of the moments clockwise must equal the sum of the moments anticlockwise. So that's principle number two, which I usually think of as being the first one, but it doesn't really matter what order they're in. And here we're saying principle number one is that the resultant force must be zero, right? So if there are only three forces, this is just an example. If there are only three forces, they must form a closed triangle. But if you've got a group of forces acting in all directions, so let's say you have a force up, a force down, a force sideways, a force sideways, they must all cancel each other out. They must all be equal in magnitude, opposite direction, to cancel each other out. Or you could have a force up, but like they said with the closed triangle, you could still have one that way, one that way, and they, whoops, and they, if you, you can see these don't quite work. If I shifted this uh, down to here, it would be still overhanging a little bit, but they should add up to zero. Just as in, you can walk 10 metres one way, 10 metres another way, 10 metres another way, and still end up where you came from, having been displaced by zero metres. Um, you can add up three forces and they add up to zero. You can add up a thousand forces and they add up to zero. Okay, so let's see how this is applied in the next question. Pause the video, have an attempt at the question. Okay, right, so let's have a quick read. In the system shown, a light rigid beam, so basically what that means is, is assume the beam has no mass. It's pivoted at x, so it's pivoted here, we're considering the pivot here. It's held in position by a string which is fixed at y. The beam carries a load of 200 newtons. The load is moved towards x, so we're going that way. Okay, whoops. Move, move towards x, moving it this way, okay. So, which of the following statements is correct? Okay, so we've got to be careful when we ask these types of questions. Sometimes they ask which one is incorrect, sometimes they ask which one is correct. So what I'm going to do first of all, 
is if I move this this way, well, I can consider this in terms of moments, right, and vectors. But if I take this is the pivot point, this is acting as a clockwise moment, which means that this string must be turning this thing anti-clockwise, right? So whatever the moment produced by this uh, weight is, it must be equal to the moment produced by the string. So if you move the weight this way, this distance gets smaller, which means the moment gets smaller. So the anti-clockwise moment doesn't need to be bigger, it needs to be smaller to maintain equilibrium. So the tension in the string increases, well no, the tension in the string will decrease. Okay. So the next bit says the compression force in the beam increases. Right, well this is a bit tough. Let's imagine that the weight is right out on the edge here. Okay, so I'm going to draw a little diagram of that. Here you've got the wall, here's the beam, and the weight is here. Okay, so the weight, this thing here, okay, draw it a bit bigger. That arrow has got to be completely cancelled out. There's going to be three forces acting on it. You're going to have the tension in the string acting this way, right? But then there has to be another force balancing it out. So where's that coming from? Well, this is a rigid beam, okay, and you can imagine that the beam would actually be pushing out this way. Okay, and when you take these three forces, if I move this to here, okay, so I've literally moved that, and I move this arrow, which is the weight arrow, to here, you can see they all add up to zero because the thing is in equilibrium. If I move, if I move the weight in closer to here, it makes this arrow get smaller. Okay. So, this arrow becomes smaller, this arrow stays the same size, what happens to the size of this arrow? Well, it's going to have to get smaller, right? So they don't quite add up to um, the same as the weight now, that and that, you've got some overhang, right, this extra bit of weight. So where's that, where's that coming from, where, what's going on there? Well there is an additional force that we're not really taking into account when we're only looking at where this is, that the wall itself is going to be providing an upward force which will counter that little bit to maintain this whole body in equilibrium because if we think of the entire beam, um, it's attached to the wall and the wall is providing some support force upwards as well as some sort of support force in this direction. Okay, so I don't think that the compression form in the beam will increase, I think it will decrease. Okay, the moment of the load about x increases. Well that's clearly wrong as this gets smaller the and the clockwise moment will definitely get smaller. Okay, so this leaves us only with this as being correct but still, let's check it. The magnitude of the vertical component of the reaction at x increases. Right, well, what are we talking about? We're talking about the same thing we were just talking about there. If you move this in, if it was slid all the way until it was here, the weight, then what's that? It's the same as putting a nail in the wall, hammering it in, and hanging a weight off it, right? The wall is practically providing 100% of the vertical component of the force. So not a surprise. Quite a lot in this question actually to imagine and think about. It's a tough topic vectors is, but um, if you have any questions about this particular question please um, do do uh, ask about it. It was question number four in this video so in the comments um, discussion uh, would be helpful. Okay pause the video, read this question and attempt it. Okay so relatively straightforward we definitely know momentum is a scalar because momentum momentum is equal to mass multiplied by velocity and the rule is generally if you've got a vector in the calculation um, so for instance with moments moments equals force times distance the force is a vector 
which makes the thing you're calculating a vector as well. So D would be the correct answer. The only place where this doesn't really work is with energy. So for instance, you might have a formula for energy where you have half mv squared, and you've got the V in there, but actually this doesn't make energy a vector. Energy is kind of like an exception. Okay, well I hope you found these videos useful. Please comment, like, subscribe, and share. Thanks for watching.